Good morning, Southwest, and welcome to our online-only service today. We're happy to join you this morning in your homes. Our service is only online because there was a scheduling conflict at the rugby club. So we're grateful for technology today and the ability to join you via YouTube. We're blessed right now to have Lynn and Colleen leading us into a time of worship.
just listen for one that kind of pops out to you, that you can hold close to you today. You are wild and unique. You are a delight to your God. You are made for climbing mountains. You are just patient enough. You are designed to be kind. You are seen and every detail of your heart is known by God. You are worthy of admiration. You're worthy of attention. You are worthy of affection. You are more valuable than chests of golden treasure. You are ready. You are clarity in the confusion. You are not making mistakes, just discovering the best way to do things. You are the target of God's love. You are the one that God trusts with your life. You are equipped to do the task that feels too big. You are being anointed for everything that God has appointed you to do. You are at your best when you rest in him. You are leading the next generation to life. You are surrounded by people who care about you more than they can say or show you. You are pulsing with the creative energy of the Holy Spirit. You are carrying miracle-making words in your mouth. You are a brushstroke of the artist almighty. You are good. He said so in the beginning, and nothing will ever change that. God, I pray that those words would stick just where they need to stick this morning. Help us to hear your affection. Help us to hear your love. Help us to know you more. Amen. You can be seated. Hello again, Southwest. I'd love to highlight a few things for you this morning. First off, our junior highs are at Camp Caroline this weekend. They're enjoying the ABA Junior High Youth Retreat. We had 10 youth and leaders go out to Camp Caroline this weekend, which is an awesome turnout. This is a chance for our junior hires to grow closer to God and to each other. Friends, we're gonna take a moment now to pray for our tithes and offerings and our service together. All of our giving is online and you can use the QR code that's on the screen to get to our giving page. Let's pray. Father, we are so thankful for this day that you've made for us a chance to worship you. Lord, we thank you for our youth, our junior hires that are at Camp Caroline and Colton and the other leaders. We pray your blessing over them as they finish off the retreat and they come home. God, we just pray for the things that they learn this weekend to apply to their lives and for them to live those things out. Lord, we thank you for this time together. We thank you for your many blessings over us. Lord, we pray that we would be good stewards of the things that you've put us in charge of. We pray, Father, that you would take the gifts that you've given us, that you would multiply them, and that you would use them for your glory and honor. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. This morning, we're taking a little walk down memory lane as Pastor Ken will be preaching to us from Toefield, Alberta. Some of you may remember this sermon that took place on a sheep ranch east of Edmonton. This message is still so applicable and an excellent reminder of how God looks at the heart. 
Southwest, we would love for you to take a moment now to sign our digital friendship book. You can use the QR code that's on the screen. Signing the book is an encouragement to us as staff. We read those and we will get back to you as soon as we can. So please grab your device right now and sign that digital friendship book. Friends, as we move into the Christmas season, let's keep giving to those in need on the forefront of our minds. This next video will give us an idea of where we can focus some of our generosity this Christmas season. So please think about the Hope Mission and the Food Bank as you do your shopping in the coming days and weeks. Well, hello, Nathan. How are you today? I'm so mad. Oh, Ooh, you sure are. What's wrong today? Well, David, my shepherd, oh, he won't let me just play wherever I want to play. Oh, that grass over there looks like so much fun and I can't go. Well, do you think he has a reason? Oh, he says there's dangers over there. He just wants to boss me around. He just wants to control me. Ooh, controlling. That's very seriously. You sound very frustrating. Well, he just bosses me around. Oh, well, a good shepherd will make sure his sheep only goes where it's safe, though. Right? If there's wild animals over there, are you ready to face them? No. Mm, so it might be wise to do what the, what the shepherd says, huh? Oh, okay, yeah. But, but, but I'm, I'm smart. I've grown up. I, I know stuff. And, and you know what? I, I want to lead. Mm, I know we all want to lead. Sometimes we have to be trained, though. Yeah, he makes me follow someone else. I'm, I'm all grown up. I can lead. Mm, but sometimes we learn to be humble when we follow someone else. Isn't that correct? Oh, oh, yeah, that's probably right. Oh, but then he treats me like a baby. Oh, my, oh, my, there's so much going on, Nathan. Why does he treat you like a baby? Well, he puts oil on my head and he he bandages up my injuries and he carries me on his shoulders when I've got a sore paw. Oh, those sounds like things that a good shepherd does for you there, Nathan. Well, it sounds like what a good shepherd does to show his caring and how much he loves you and he's got compassion for you. He's just trying to be kind. Oh, yeah, I guess so. Oh, this is so hard to learn. I want to be grown up so fast. Mm, I believe you. I can see that. But a good shepherd is one that cares for his sheep, teaches him good lessons, and sometimes that's by making us humble, taking us through situations where we're not always first, and mm, allowing us to be cared for when we're injured. It's okay to be on the shepherd's shoulders, nice and close to the shepherd. 
Yeah, okay, I guess you're right. It's just hard to learn. Mm, you're right, Nathan, it is hard to learn. But that's the good thing, is you can keep learning every day. Right? Can you trust that you have a good shepherd? Yeah, he's really good. Mm, do you know that your shepherd is caring and kind? Yeah, he really is. Mm, well, there you go. So if you rest in that knowledge that your shepherd is taking good care of you, and he's doing what's best for you, you can follow his orders. Does that sound okay? Oh, yeah. And for us Southwest kids, it's true for us too, just like for Nathan. Some lessons are hard to learn. Sometimes we have situations that are hard to face. But the closer you stay to the shepherd, the more that you will learn how to follow him. And the more you become like him, the more you get things for your good and for his glory. So trust the shepherd. Trust Jesus. He really is our good shepherd. Good morning, Southwest. Today's scripture reading is from 1 Samuel chapter 16, verses 4 to 13 in the NLT version. And it goes like this. So Samuel did as the Lord instructed. When he arrived at Bethlehem, the elders of the town came trembling to meet him. What's wrong? They asked. Do you come in peace? Yes, Samuel replied. I have come to sacrifice to the Lord. Purify yourselves and come with me to, sa to the sacrifice. Then Samuel performed the purification rite for Jesse and his sons and invited them to the sacrifice too. When they arrived, Samuel took one look at Eliab and thought, Surely this is the Lord's anointed. But the Lord said to Samuel, Don't judge by his appearance or height, for I have re rejected him. The Lord doesn't see things the way you see them. People judge by outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. Then Jesse took his son, Abinadab, to step forward and walk in front of Samuel. But Samuel said, This is not the one the Lord has chosen. Next, Jesse summoned Shimeah. But Samuel said, Neither is this one the Lord has chosen. In the same way, all seven of Jesse's sons were presented to Samuel. But Samuel said to Jesse, The Lord has not chosen any of these. Then Samuel asked, Are these all the sons you have? There is still the youngest, Jesse replied, but he's out in the fields watching the sheep and goats. Send for him at once, Samuel said. We will not sit down to eat until he arrives. So Jesse sent for him. He was dark and handsome with beautiful eyes. And the Lord said, this is the one, anoint him. So as David stood there among his brothers, Samuel took the flask of olive oil he had brought and anointed David with the oil. And the Spirit of the Lord came powerfully upon David from that day on. Then Samuel returned to Ramah. Have a great rest of your service. Hey, good morning, everyone. Uh, we're out here on a sheep ranch in Tofield. It's a beautiful spot. We're about uh, 40 miles uh, east of Edmonton. And really grateful to Levi, uh, Levi Stahl and his father, uh, John, for uh, the willingness to allow us to do a video here uh, on the Hutterite Colony in Tofield. We really appreciate uh, their kindness to us. And there's lots of sheep around. Now, when we mention sheep and a biblical character, I think you automatically know who the person is that we're talking about. Absolutely. His name is David. Uh, I grew up on a farm, uh, but we never had sheep. We had cattle and we had milk cows, we had pigs, we had chickens, we had turkeys, but no sheep and no goats and no geese. But this is a great looking flock of sheep. Uh, some are in the pasture. There's others spread around the farmyard here. And, you know, I learned a few things about sheep this week. Uh, sheep have a reputation for being stupid, <laughs> defenseless, and harmless creatures that mope about on hillsides uh, uh, doing not very much. Uh, they're good for two things, to uh, be eaten or produce wool. Well, the reality is that sheep are actually surprisingly intelligent and they have an impressive memory and recognition skills. They build friendships, uh, they stick up for one another in fights, and they feel sad when their friends are sent to slaughter. So intelligent, complex, sociable, uh, all words that we would quickly assign to humans, but would not dream of extending to sheep. Those fluffy white creatures you see milling about in fields or served up with mint sauce on your dinner plate. 
Uh, indeed, we have decreed that sheep are just rather plain, ordinary, and not too smart. Well, the truth is that sheep are far smarter than we know. Uh, on a trip to Israel, my father and I got, a, got up a little early one morning, and we visited the sheep market in Old Jerusalem. And there we saw a couple of hundred sheep in the marketplace. And, and lo and behold, a shepherd came along with about 10 sheep following him. And he chose to take them right through the larger flock of sheep. We thought they'd all get mixed up for sure. But uh, he just talked to them all the way through and they obediently followed him. They were smart. They heard his voice and they followed him. Uh, it was amazing. And, you know, we could make some wonderful hearing God applications from that story, couldn't we? There's a 2001 study by Keith Kendrick, who is now at the University of Electronic Science and Technology in China. He found that, that sheep can recognize and remember at least 50 individual faces for more than two years. That's longer than many humans. The team also found evidence that sheep can differentiate facial expressions, and they prefer a smile to a frown. Sheep have excellent peripheral vision. Maybe you knew this, that their large rectangular pupils allow them to see almost 360 degrees. And they can also see behind themselves without turning their heads. So I think sheep have gotten a bad rap on their intelligence. And in some ways, they're, they're quite intelligent. Now, what about shepherds? Uh, from the beginning of time, shepherds have been the proverbial ditch diggers, the downtrodden, the disrespected. Uh, hence, even the angels came to the shepherds, the lowliest all of, of all men, to share the news of the birth of Christ, uh, you know, as the, story, as the Christmas story is told. Over the centuries, nothing has changed much. From the shepherds of the hills of Scotland to the shepherds of the new western frontier, all have been discriminated, discriminated upon and viewed as a, a lowly class through the ages. Even today, many wish not to be referred to as shepherds, but instead as ranchers. Uh, this is somewhat of a contextual look at David during his young adult years. Here's our thought this morning. Every individual has a purpose for living. Every one of us. Uh, I know that you believe this, but every individual has a purpose for living. Every one of us. No one God brings to life on this earth is insignificant. And the tragedy of all tragedies is that we should live and die having never found that purpose that special God-ordained reason for serving our generation. Whatever it is that God is calling you toward, you are to discover that and carry it out. And then when your twilight years come and your life is ended, you can be satisfied that you've served God's purpose with your life. A few years ago, a wonderful lady, 91 years old, uh, wanted me to come and visit her in the hospital. And she only had a very short time left on the planet. But we talked about her life, and uh, she was eager to talk about her passing. She was so excited to meet Jesus and to be with him, absolutely ready to go. She asked me if I would do her funeral service. And of course, I said, yes, I would, I would do that. And when I'm asked to do a memorial service, my starting point is always to see what I know about the person that has died and what is the theme of their life. And in this case, I already knew the theme of her life. I've never told anyone before what I'm going to say at their funeral. But in this case, I thought I would tell her because the Lord had already prompted it into my, my own heart. And I said to her, I want to characterize your life as purposeful. And I want to speak on the theme of living our days with intentionality, with purposeful intentionality. I see that you've lived that way, and I just want to honor that. Well, she said, I haven't cried much during these days, but that makes me cry. She had done a great job of living her life. So when the twilight years uh, came and 
her life was ending, she was she she could be well satisfied that she'd served God's purpose with her life. So just to help us along that trajectory in life, I want us to think about what God said to David. Listen to these words. I took you from tending sheep in the pasture and selected you to be the leader of my people, Israel. I've been with you wherever you have gone, and I have destroyed all of your enemies before your eyes. And I will give you rest from all your enemies, for when you die and are buried with your ancestors, I will raise up one of your descendants, your own offspring, and I will make his kingdom strong. How do you live a life that impacts this generation? What does it look like? Where do I begin? Every life is different. Uh, We will all make unique contributions by the grace of God, according to how God has shaped us and fueled us with kingdom passions. But I'd like us to see maybe what we have in common. Where do we start? And I would suggest, number one, start with your heart. Start with your heart. I've become good friends with my cardiologist because he found out years ago that I had some blockage in the vessels in my heart. And he and his uh, surgeon friend got it unblocked. I am also good friends with my, my cardiologist father in heaven because he knows hearts better than anyone. And he always knows the status of my heart. He, he knows when my heart is open. He knows when, when it's closed. And interesting how much meaning the word heart has come to have. You know, we say, somebody's good at heart. Or we learn things by heart. Or we get into things heart and soul. And if someone is courageous, we say, she has a heart of steel. And if we want someone to show us a little compassion, we say, oh, come on, have a heart. Or if we feel deeply attached to something, we might hum a few bars of, I left my heart in San Francisco. If a friend is unnerved about something, we encourage him to set his heart at rest. If we have a tremendous desire to achieve a certain goal, we set our hearts on it. When we take something very seriously, we take it to heart. Oh, so many nuances of the word. And when you meet God and you begin a new journey of faith through inviting Jesus Christ to take control of of your heart, a whole new world opens up. We really mean that Christ becomes the leader of our lives. And because Jesus is the one who has come to this world and he was willing to give his life for us so that he could take our sins and deal with it forever. So when you say yes to Christ, you are saying, forgive me, help me get started on a new road, and I give you my heart. God wants to cultivate our hearts as we follow him. I mean, that's his mission in us, to cultivate our hearts, to to look more like his heart. And it's also the first step in preparing us to impact our generation. You know, uh, David was born about 10 years after Saul became king. He was born into a generation that was experiencing a, a great deal of turbulence. And the people of Israel were drifting again. And their king, King Saul, was also drifting. This once humble king was no longer humble. And Samuel, the prophet, says to King Saul, your kingdom shall not endure. The Lord has sought out for himself a man after his own heart. In other words, you're done. Another man will be chosen. Although it it took a considerable length of time for that to happen. But the prophet said to Saul, God has sought out for himself a man after his heart own heart. And you know, uh, those became defining words for David, a man after God's heart. We live in challenging times, don't we? Uh, It was equally true in David's time. There was a crisis of all, uh, all around. Israel was struggling to survive the constant threats of her enemies, and nothing really has changed through the centuries. However, this sense of crisis and unpredictability of the times we live in can also present an opportunity. Do you know that the word crisis is also the same word for opportunity? The Greek word is kairos. It means crisis or opportunity. In crisis moments, we're challenged as the people of God, not simply to just survive, but to actually thrive. God needed someone to lead his people who had the Father's heart. And God invites every one of us to a cause greater than ourselves, that of impacting our generation. It's a new day. Uh, it's, a new, it's a new year. It's a challenging world. It's a culture that's undergoing seismic turbulence. 
And God has us on the scene. He has you on the screen, on the scene. He has you on your block. He has you in your school. He has you in your office, at your business, and in your home. And for us in this church, Southwest Community Church, a church that is longing to impact our generation. So we're about having the Father's heart, having hearts that follow the heart of God. Now, you must not get the idea that David was some superman. He wasn't. I mean, we look up to him, but as you know, he was very human. He made lots of mistakes. Uh, he was certainly far from perfect. But what did God see in David that he loved? He had a sensitive heart. Yeah, that's, that, was a, that was a great starting point. He was tuned into God. And somehow David just really connected with God. He came to really value God in his life, and the relationship became natural and meaningful. And as David got to know God, he only wanted to bless him and please him. That means there were no locked doors, there were no hidden closets in his life, nothing swept under the rug. I'm sure wherever David, whenever David grieved the heart of God, he was, he was restless until he got it settled. So he had a sensitive heart. And when he heard God say, go this direction, he did it. And when God said, now it's time to go this direction, he did it. And perhaps that's a place for all of us to start or continue cultivating our hearts for God. Sensitivity. God be at home in my life. Everything is yours. I want my life to be natural and genuine as I walk with you. I think maybe the second thought that needs underscoring is humility. I mean, it's quite a story, isn't it, of God being on a surveillance mission in the home of Jesse. Remember that story? And God rejected all of the other sons, young men that looked like they might fit the bill, tall, dark, and handsome. But in reality, God chooses the young guy that doesn't even get called to the meeting. And David's out somewhere in the field. He's tending the sheep. But the Lord saw in David a heart that was completely his. The boy was faithfully keeping his father's sheep. God saw humility. He saw a servant's heart. Psalm 78 says that he, God, also chose David his servant and took him from the sheepfolds. Love that. It's as if God says, I don't care about all the slick public image business. Show me a person who has a right heart and is humble. And I will give the image that he or she needs to make a difference in his, this generation. Uh, is the person a servant in their heart? Are they humble? Are they authentic? If I want to impact my generation, it starts with humility. Lord, I don't stand above my generation. Lord, I don't condemn it. I don't think I'm better than my generation. I don't stand under it. It's filled with sadness and tragedy and distortions of God's intent. But I come alongside my generation to serve them. How can I serve my generation? How can I serve my neighbor? How can I serve my family? Well, God looked at David uh, out in the fields, in the, in the foothills surrounding Bethlehem, keeping his father's sheep, faithfully doing his job, and God passes his approval on the young man. So while David's brothers were off in the army fighting big, impressive battles, David was all alone keeping the sheep. And he was okay with that. He had a servant's heart. Uh, but God was training him. And this is a reminder this morning of servanthood. How does God want you to be a servant? And if you will serve wherever God wants you to, and if your heart is humble, it's a wonderful place for God to meet you and grow you and lead you. And how did God help cultivate David's heart? Well, first of all, he put him in a place of solitude. Kind of like out here, it's just so peaceful and quiet and uh the sheep are all around and uh, the sun is setting. It's just beautiful. Uh, but God put David in a place of solitude where he could learn some major lessons all alone before he could be trusted with responsibilities in public. And if you read the account of the Apostle Paul, I mean, he had some pretty significant desert times before he started his public ministry. There's, there's something about solitude that is so good for us. 
I mean, usually we have this incredible noise all around us. That's, that's why it's so peaceful out here. I mean, it's just like you, you get a chance to think. And usually we're walking around with these little earphones in our ears and they're blocking out all of our, of our quietness that leads to a, a quiet and, and joyful heart. Solitude was one of the teachers that God used. I mean, if you say it's hard to find solitude in my life, I would tend to agree. It, it just really does take a whole lot of intentionality to find space where you can be alone and where you can listen and where you can slow the RPMs, where you can set aside the devices, uh, even in solitude. Solitude is a place where the voice of God becomes clearer. <laughs> can you find a way to carve out some solitude so you can better hear the voice of God? Secondly, uh, he put him in a place of obscurity. Sometimes God trains us when we're out of the limelight so we can handle the limelight should it come our way. Men and women of God, servant leaders in the making, are often in unknown places. They are unseen. They are unappreciated. And they are unapplauded. Uh, maybe you're going through a bit of a desert time yourself. You can see it as that or you can see it as training time training time. This is valuable time in the formation of God's heart in your heart. And if you have an open heart to receive the feedback you get from others, uh, you will grow. Now, sometimes you have to filter and run uh, the feedback that you get from others for your own grid. But if you completely reject feedback, you won't grow. So receive the, fil the feedback, run it through the grid, and, and let it help you grow. Maybe you're in a place of obscurity right now. You wonder, where in the world is my life going? Uh, it can be a good place to be. It may be an obscure place, but here is a place to say, God, train me, prepare me, use me, use this time in my life. This is what I need to do. I need to receive the feedback that comes through obscurity. Now, there are things that God wants to teach me, uh, uh, thirdly, he put him in a place of routine. He put him in a place of routine. This is often where we learn to be men and women who seek after God's heart. There aren't a lot of shiny buttons to admire. It's simply same old, same old. And that was David's life. He was faithful in what was on his plate day after day, day after day, looking after the same old sheep. A shepherd or a rancher commented, Many days around sunset, which would be just about now, I will check my flock and simply sit for an hour watching the serenity of a sheep's life with its head down, eating sweet grasses with lambs at their side. He said, I know of no way to forget the stress of business and farm life for a few minutes than simply watching a lamb come into the world or watching them graze on a beautiful pasture. We don't stop to smell the roses around here, he said. We stop and admire our flock of sheep, and maybe pet a few as well. Well, a place of routine, a place of faithfulness. And shepherds, like the sheep themselves, learn quickly that the path to success depends on the routine of tending to the flock, but also caring for the individual, providing clean water. There's a water tank up here. Food and shelter to an entire flock is essential to maintaining the health of the flock. But the success of a shepherd is in the compassion they have for each individual. This means being able to identify a sick or injured sheep or lamb within a flock and going and finding the sheep that wanders away. We know the biblical story in that. It's the rhythm of caring for the flock and caring for the individual. So if God has put you in the seemingly menial, insignificant, routine, unexciting, uneventful daily tasks of life, it may indeed be extremely valuable. God trains us through being faithful, just constant, endless hours of, uh, of routine as you learn to be a man or woman of God with nobody else around, when nobody else notices, when nobody else even cares. Maybe you're in a place of routine right now. Stay faithful, stay open, trust God for his timing. And then fourthly, uh, he put him in a place of reality. Where does God have you these days 
in the, in the heart preparation process. You may feel that you're out in the pasture. Maybe you feel like you're out in left field somewhere, but it's not a bad place to be if God is working on your heart and you are listening to his voice. Sometimes we don't even uh, realize uh, that God has us on hold. And maybe the dreams that we have for our lives don't get fulfilled instantly. God gives you the dream on one day, but he doesn't fulfill it the next day. One day, David's father, Jesse, sent him on a little assignment to take some food to his brothers. You know the story, who were fighting in the Israeli army against the Philistines. And Goliath is the Philistine champion, and he's an imposing man, if you ever saw one, standing over nine feet tall in the right corner, wearing far more than just red trunks. I mean, he is, he is Goliath from Gath, and he is huge. And Goliath from Gath was a shouter. He shouted every morning for 40 mornings, and this huge giant bellowed across the canyon every day, choose one man to come down here and fight me. And if he kills me, then we will be your slaves. But if I kill him, you will be our slaves. I defy the armies of Israel today. Well, that wrecked uh, the day for King Saul and his whole army. I mean, it wrecked every day for 40 days. And they heard this, uh, uh, and they just shook in their boots at the thought of anyone going out there to fight Goliath. And David had no idea that this particular morning his life would be impacted forever. He just went to deliver some bagels to his brothers. But in the process, he heard the shout of the giant. And honestly, it surprised him that everyone was so intimidated by that shout. I mean, it was his first time to hear the shout. And really, it made David mad. <laughs> made him say in his heart, who does this big bully think he is? He can't talk about God that way, not our God. He can't talk about our nation that way. We are God's people. <laughs> and I guess you can never predict a day. They all look pretty ordinary until one day you find yourself in the middle of something you didn't ask for. And for David, it changed the trajectory of his life. And you know the story of how David took out this giant. Goliath was no big deal. Why? Well, because David had been killing lions and bears while nobody was around. He'd been facing reality long before he squared off against Goliath. It was only because of David coming to know the Father's heart that he was able to handle the pressure of this day. Friends, real pressures, intimidation, giants in your life, they're handled through the cultivation of the heart. Sensitivity, humility, obscurity, routine, solitude, and so on. All of this is part of the formation process as God helps fashion our hearts to be those that look like his in order to impact our generation. Well, can I conclude where I started? Every individual has a purpose for living, every one of us. Whatever season of life you're in, what a great moment to say, Lord, you have all of me. I know you're still teaching me. I know you're still training me, perhaps still preparing me. I'm open to all you want to teach me. And for some that are listening, thank you for the things that you've taught me. Thanks for new lessons that you want me to pay attention to. I'm still open to all you want to teach me, Father. Would you cup your hands before the Lord and say, here's my heart, Lord, here's my heart. And let's pray together. Father in heaven, you remind us that the Lord does not look at the things that people look at. People look at the outward appearance, but Lord, you look at the heart. So we present our hearts to you today. Take my life and let it be consecrated, Lord, to thee. Take my moments and my days, let them flow in ceaseless praise. Take my hands and let them move at the impulse of thy love. Take my heart, it's thine alone, it shall be thy royal throne. Take my love, my Lord, I pour at your feet. It's a treasure store. Take myself and I will be ever only all for thee. Lord, in this generation, raise up your sons and daughters to present their hearts for you to impact those who live in this day. We pray in Jesus' name and for his sake. Amen and amen. 
Thanks, Pastor Ken, for that meaningful message from 1 Samuel 16. I love that God wants to use all of us. We just need to have ready and willing hearts. Let's end our service with this word of blessing. God, may we be men and women after your very own heart. May we be people that see a crisis as an opportunity to look more like you. Holy Spirit, may we have sensitive and humble hearts to hear your voice. And Father, may our hearts be passionate enough to stand up and take on giants. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. All right, be blessed, Southwest. Have an awesome week. See ya.